Hey everyone, Dr. Winnie Coster is professor of English, ready for Halloween and all the spookiness of the season, which is why today's lecture is on the cask of Amontillado, Edgar Allan Poe's 1846 famous story centered on wine and vengeance. I'm especially excited for this time of year because it means we can start reveling in scary Gothic tales like Faulkner's A Rose for Emily, Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, and Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, all of which I either have lectures on or will have lectures on in the next couple of weeks, so please be sure to check those out. And while we're at it, if you enjoy discussions on classic literature and writing, then please subscribe to my channel so that you're kept up to date on my weekly postings. This story is a confession or remembrance or retelling of the murder of Fortunato some 50 years ago. Now, some readers have suggested that Montresor is likely confessing to a priest upon his deathbed, but I don't think this possible. For one thing, Montresor says the listener well knows the nature of his soul, and that means that he knows Montresor's obsession to punish a wrong with impunity, meaning he must never be caught or punished himself. Decades after he commits the murder, Montresor displays no anxiety, guilt, or regret, calmly defending the notion that a wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser, and it is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. In other words, Montresor is not confessing for the sake of salvation. For one thing, the church does not honor a punishment with impunity. And furthermore, it's clear that not only does Montresor have zero remorse about what he did to Fortunato, but he still fervently believes he has done nothing wrong. Quite the opposite, really. In his eyes, this was not an act of cold-blooded murder. It was a justified act of retribution, one that honored Montresor's family's arms, which you will remember is a huge human foot crushing a snake whose fangs are embedded in the heel, as well as the family motto, which is, no one attacks me with impunity. This motto of justified vengeance then is part of his lineage, his nature, blood, and family reputation. And he remains loyal to his family, reminding Fortunato at one point, as they literally stand amidst his ancestors' bones in the family catacombs, that the Montresors were a great and numerous family. But at present, the Montresors seem to have lost their reputation and standing in society, as Fortunato has to be reminded what the Montresor family coat of arms and motto are. And Montresor, excluded from the Freemason society, is bemused by Fortunato's cryptic hand gesture known only to the Masonic Brotherhood. And Montresor himself acknowledges his family's social decline, remarking to Fortunato, you are happy as once I was you are a man to be missed. Even Montresor's servants clearly don't respect him, as he well knows, saying, I had told them that I should not return until morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. It's clear then that the aristocratic Montresors have been replaced by those like Fortunato, men who earn their wealth and power by chance and not lineage. Remember, Fortunato's name means blessed, fortunate, fortune. And it seems that the major insult here was simply the fact that a man like Fortunato thought nothing of disrespecting a Montresor. After all, who are they these days? So it's especially fitting that Montresor chooses the carnival season, you know, think of like Mardi Gras today, to exact his revenge, as this was not only a time when routines were broken and people were distracted with merriment and drink, but it was also a time when identities were destabilized and traditional social hierarchy and etiquette collapsed. This is why then the powerful Fortunato is dressed as the fool and Montresor his executioner. Montresor's crime helps to destabilize or recalibrate the new power dynamics that have given people like Fortunato the means to insult and injure noblemen like Montresor. And I think that this can be read as evidence that the unnamed listener is a younger member of the Montresor family being trained in the importance of honoring the Montresor family code. This may be why Montresor includes so much detail and relish for what he has done. There's no sign of guilt because he abided by all the rules and codes that by principle he believes one must honor. 
In fact, the very first line of the story illustrates this point. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. Here, Montresor makes an effort to prove that he's not just a petty person. He'll bear thousands of insults since those do not officially justify vengeance, but the minute the line is crossed and requires action, he will take it. And you'll notice that despite all the details Montresor provides about his murderous deed, he neglects to identify the insult that set all of this in motion. It doesn't matter what the insult was though, the act itself is enough to, um, to offend and warrant this revenge. And to name it would give us the means to measure the crime to the insult. And there's likely no insult in our eyes anyway that could ever justify Montresor's deed. As in so many horror stories, the reader is left to his own devices to imagine the most horrible and unthinkable possibilities. Perhaps another reason Montresor seems to show no compassion, regret, or compunction about murdering Fortunato is because he gave him every reason, every indication to turn back. And even then, we're told how Fortunato is the one who possesses himself of the narrator's arm and hurries him back to the narrator's palazzo, insisting that they continue on until they reach the Amontillado. A master manipulator, Montresor exploits Fortunato's greatest weaknesses, his love for wine, his FOMO, his arrogance, and his disdain for Lucchese, another wine connoisseur whose name Montresor constantly drops as a reminder that Fortunato is not only disposable, but replaceable in this scenario. And I use the air quotes because at one point, Fortunato, while insulting Lucchese, says, don't ask Lucchese to inspect the Amontillado. He can't tell an Amontillado from Sherry. But if you're a real wine aficionado, then you would know that Amontillado is a type of Sherry. Anyway, it's these four things that in short, it will be Fortunato who leads the way down to his own murder site awaiting him. And as they descend to the vault, Montresor manipulates Fortunato, expressing his need for an expert to inspect his Amontillado and pretending to show an even greater concern for Fortunato's health, reminding him time and time again that the vaults in which the Amontillado is kept are insufferably damp and encrusted with nitre, which is a chemical that significantly exacerbates the respiratory problems from which Fortunato already suffers. Fortunato, though, is too drunk on wine, too full of himself to notice much else, but we as readers see all of the symbols of murder and death or the overwhelming amount of foreshadowing that appears in this story. So this is what we call dramatic irony, when the reader knows crucial information that a character in the story does not, and it makes the experience for us that much more pleasurable, exciting, horrifying, intense, whatever. After a coughing fit, Montresor says that they should turn back, but Fortunato assures him that he won't die of a cough, don't worry, to which Montresor creepily confirms. Plying him with wine, I mean, including a bottle of de Grave, like Grave, to help ease his growing cough, Montresor and Fortunato drink to the buried that repose around them, referencing the fact that they are literally standing in a graveyard of Montresor's. And it totally escapes Fortunato that Montresor is costumed as death in his long black robe and black mask, and that he himself is dressed as the fool and acting the part every step of the way. As they descend further into the vault, Montresor is subservient and continuously acknowledges Fortunato's superiority, while Fortunato throws insults at Montresor, laughing at the idea that someone like Montresor could ever be part of the Freemason society, and then being very bemused when Montresor says he is in fact a Mason and pulls out a trowel, a brick laying or masonry tool. In doing so, Montresor, Montresor upholds Fortunato's belief that Montresor is not of equal social standing as he professes to be that type of Mason that is far less elite than the Freemasons. Now, most people at this point would show some concern that their friend has such a random tool on their person while they're supposed to be wine tasting, but at this point, Fortunato is too drunk, too arrogant, or too foolish to care, and so easily continues on to his death. And even as he's chained to the wall, watching Montresor lay brick after brick after brick, Fortunato continues to insult him, refusing to take Montresor seriously. 
Now the thing is, we need to ask ourselves if Montresor really got what he wanted. He wanted retribution, but it seems that Fortunato dies without recognizing what he did to deserve this in the first place. And that doesn't satisfy Montresor's conditions of pure vengeance. Montresor revels in the idea that Fortunato must confront his errors and admit that Montresor has the last say by reestablishing the family's honor. But that's not really what happens. Fortunato laughs at the circumstance, treating it all as a mutual joke that they can laugh about in the future over their amontillado. But at the last second, when Fortunato realizes that Montresor is serious, all he says is, for the love of God, Montresor. And Montresor replies, yes, for the love of God. But Fortunato does not respond. Montresor says, oh, these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato, no answer. I called again, Fortunato, no answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in reply only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. The jingling sound of the bells, I think is one of the creepiest moments in the story. And you'd think that it would be a sound that would haunt Montresor for the rest of his life, but what it really signifies, I think, is that instead of a long, slow, and painful death of suffering the superiority of Montresor, Fortunato suffers none. The jingling of the bells suggests that he's already dead, his head falling forward as his body slumps forward. And when Montresor says his heart grew sick, we have to wonder if it really is from the dampness of the catacombs, as he so quickly claims, or if it's from the fact that his vengeance was not properly executed. Again, I don't ever get the sense that Montresor questions or is unsettled what, with what he's done, so I don't think his heart grows sick that he just murdered another human being. Tell me what you guys think. Whom is he talking to? Do you think that he has any regrets at all? I will end the lecture with a few more questions. What does it tell us that Montresor remembers with such precision the details of his crime? Does he replay it over and over in his mind to relive his vengeance or to consider what he could have done differently? Is he relishing it by reliving it? And how do you feel now that you know all the gruesome details of this 50 year old crime that has remained uncovered? Do you feel complicit? manipulated? While Montresor is for certain an unreliable narrator, we do know that he is a master manipulator, and so we've got to be prepared that we too have been manipulated. Let me know your thoughts and ideas on this very macabre story, and please be sure to check out some of my other videos for more insight on classic pieces like Maupassant's The Necklace, Sendex, Where the Wild Things Are, and Bradbury's A Sound of Thunder. I will see you guys over there.